Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's uh, Tuesday, December the 19th, 2023. It is our last meeting of the year. Hard, hard to actually believe, but here we are. And I'm going to be adjourning and calling this meeting to order at 6.29 p.m. So I'm going to start with a moment of silent reflection. But before we go to the moment of silence this evening, I'd like to wish everybody very, very happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, happy Kwanaze, and to all those who are observing these celebrations over the next couple of weeks. While the holidays bring joy to many, I acknowledge that they can be challenging for many as well. In this season of reflection and connection, may it bring not only joy, but also peace, health, and happiness. And I wanna personally thank everybody in this community who has donated their time or given to the food bank or other charitable organizations and efforts over the last couple of weeks, it is going to make a difference to our neighbors and to the families and to the children in our community. And here I want to especially acknowledge the work of Councillor Adam for doing an incredible toy drive that I believe last count was going to reach 500 children in our community. So thank you very much. Oh, more now. So thank you very much. So on that note, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Moving on to our land acknowledgement, the municipality of Port Hope exists on the lands of the Mishisagic Ashinabic traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaties. We honor and recognize First Peoples as right holders and stewards of the lands and waters on which we have the privilege to live, work, and play, including the Ganaraska River and Forest. We pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. We commit to actions toward towards truth and reconciliation by recognizing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, strengthening ties with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, especially those who make their home in Port Hope, and learning from Indigenous ways of knowing and being. We do so by recognizing the past and working towards a shared future. I'm gonna start with a few community updates. So first, please note that there is no committee of the whole meeting tonight following the council meeting. As we look to the new year, kindly note that Town Hall will not be hosting a reception on January 1st. Instead, like last year, we invite you to join us at our Celebrate and Skate with Council event, a community celebration marking the beginning of the new year Celebrate and Skate takes place on Sunday, January 14th, beginning at 1 p.m. at the Jack Berger Sports Complex. Drop in, lace up, and enjoy an afternoon on or off the ice. Enjoy hot chocolate, a free public skate, and the opportunity to connect with council and your neighbors. A reminder that municipal administrative offices will close for the holidays on Friday, December the 22nd, beginning at noon, and will reopen at their usual operating hours on Tuesday, January the 2nd. Recreation facilities are operating programs and activities on modified schedules and essential services like fire and roads crews will continue operations. Visit our website at porthope.ca for details uh, or contact information over the holidays. Uh, I wanna make a couple more announcements starting with uh, I'd like to thank Deputy Mayor Todd Attridge for his leadership in the Deputy Mayor role over the last year. He's done a tremendous job in terms of advocating for the interests of this community, working closely with council and staff and myself. So thank you very much for everything that you contributed in, in this last year. 
And as per our procedural bylaw and the appointment schedule for the deputy mayor role that was approved by counselor, by council, Councilor Claire uh, Holloway Woodwani will be stepping into the deputy mayor role on January 1st, 2024. And we wish you all the best of luck in that uh, new role starting in the new year. I also want to take the opportunity to give an update on the removal of the Mason Homes woodlot, uh, which began on Friday, December the 15th. Uh, we were aware that this was going to be happening, but we were not aware that the work started on the day that it did. So it did take us a little bit uh, by surprise. But a few things that I do want to mention again about the removal. Tree removal is primarily taking place on private property owned by the developers. This is per the settlement announced by the municipality in August and approved in writing by the OLT in October. The settlement includes development on phase 5B lands for low medium density residential units with 58 single detached residential lots and 43 townhouses. The settlement, as many of you may also recall, also includes the transfer of a significant part of the privately owned Little Creek Ravine lands to the municipality. While this land was previously protected lands, it will now be under the care and control of the municipality for public recreation use by all. A $100,000 contribution to the municipality of Port Hope to be used within the municipality for tree planting and canopy replacement. The installation of enhanced landscaping features along the front dwellings on Victoria Street South. It was intended that using the best construction practices, efforts were going to be made to preserve four trees identified by municipal staff within the municipal road allowances along Victoria Street South during the construction of the 5B lands. Unfortunately, an ISA certified arborist of the developer reviewed the trees in question and determined the following. Trees are growing close together along with many other trees with a low live crown ratio, a characteristic that is typical of trees growing in groups. The trunks are tall, the foliage is all towards the top of the canopy and there is very little taper in the trunk diameter. Trees growing in these conditions rely on each other for support. And when neighboring trees are removed, the remaining trees have difficulty adapting to change in exposure to sunlight and wind level and the likelihood of failure increases significantly. With the plans to remove trees throughout the woodlot for new construction, it is not realistic to successfully retain individual trees from within the group. And from a tree risk perspective, the likelihood of failure would be probable and the construction of new homes and sidewalk would create a new potential target that could be impacted. I know this is disappointing news to many, but it was recommended at the end of the day that the four trees in question be removed. And so I provide that as an update on the Penryn Woodlot. Item number two, disclosure of pecuniary interest and the nature thereof. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? I, I note that none were received um, and seeing none, I will move on to item three. There is no closed session today. Item four, consent agenda, approval of the minutes of previous meetings. Items listed under the approval of minutes, consent agenda are considered collectively and as one motion. Council members may request that specific items be removed for separate discussion, deliberation, and action. The consent items are listed on the agenda. Would any member of council like to remove any of these items for separate discussion? Seeing none, can I get a mover and seconder to approve the minutes as listed? Um, moved by Councillor Less, seconded by Councillor Adam. All in favor, and the motion is carried. That is 4.1. Council Minute Meetings of December 5th, 2023, 4.2 Committee of the Whole Meeting Minutes of December 5th, 2023, and uh, item number 4.3, Statutory Public 
meeting minutes of December 6, 2023. Moving on to business from previous um, uh, minutes or notification of new business. Uh, is there any new business from previous minutes or notification from council members? Seeing none, um, I will uh, move on to petitions and delegations. There's one delegation listed on the agenda today. We're going to be hearing it here allocated uh, for 10 minutes. So it's now time for that delegation. So I welcome uh, Mark Huey, General Manager, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories to the podium. You have 10 minutes to speak and please press, I, I don't think I need to tell you this, <laughs> the purple button. So uh, Mark Huey is General Manager, Historic Waste Program Management Office, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories regarding an update on the Port Hope Area Initiative Project. Uh, welcome, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council, for inviting us and giving us some time tonight to give you an update. Um, and please do go ahead and give me the instructions because there was that one time I completely forgot, right? So, <laughs> all right, so we'll we'll run through this uh, briefly. I know I only have 10 minutes and just give you an update on where we are. Uh, first, we'll start with land acknowledgement and just I want to take the time to acknowledge that we work on the on the uh, traditional treaty lands of the Williams Treaty's First Nation, as well as the uh, uh, Gunshot Treaty, in particular, and uh, we feel honored and privileged to uh, to live and work on these significant lands and waterways. So today, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, current work and upcoming work, and give you a big picture update. And uh, that's a picture of us participating in the wreath ceremony. We really feel honored to do that every year. Uh, it's important to us, and uh, I wasn't able to go this year, but um, I, I did send my deputy, in, and uh, it went very well. So this is just the big picture uh, slide where it talks about all the projects we have going on. On the left side, all the, all the ones that have been completed. On the right, the ones that are underway and started. So I told you uh, when, on the first time we met, um, when you were all brand new as mayor and council, um, that by the end of this calendar year that we would have every major project that is owned by the municipality underway, and we are. So I'm really happy about that, proud of the team. Um, sometimes the hardest part's getting started, uh, but we are there and, and doing well, and we'll give you an update on each of the ones that are active. So the Harbor and Center Pier, really three big projects in one place, uh, uh, rehabbing the wall, um, doing the Center Pier excavation and, and uh, backfill, and we've, we've completed uh, a good portion of that. And on the uh, west side of the pier, all the tiebacks are in. And we're just moving on to the rest of the pier. And you'll see us moving things around as we do that. And of course, the dredging is still continuing, but we're winding down on that as well. Waterworks West, uh, the excavation is all complete now. We had a little bit of trouble getting all the contamination out as the water levels dropped for the season. Um, but we were able to do that and uh, we're backfilling. And in, in this week, uh, putting it in a condition so that we can um, not only uh, do the shutdown for the Christmas break and holiday break, but also to prepare it for restoration in the spring when the when it's more conducive to uh, growing grass and planting trees. Highland Drive landfill, that's just a big hole and uh, it's uh, it's gone really, really well. Um, a lot of a lot of waste coming out of there. We're in the phase three now, which is where we sort the garbage from the LLRW. And so the garbage will go back in that hole as we move towards the high school. And so that's uh, it's going quite well. I, and um, I think that's all I want to say about that. Why? Well, I will say that we have been prepared for some odors coming out of the out of there. We really haven't had any to speak of. No complaints from the residents nearby um, that we may change as we get really into the garbage moving forward and in the summertime. But we have a good control that we apply every day for that. Our long-term waste management facility is still working really well. A new contractor took over. Housekeeping is, is spectacular and uh, very structured more than it was in the past. And uh, we've moved, as you can see, 1.8 million tons of waste and safely stored it there. And we actually hit a peak of, uh, since the last time I talked to you, 200 trucks in one day, uh, which was really good for us and did it safely. Lions Park, uh, that's also underway. Had a real water management problem. You see that in the left picture there where the groundwater just was giving us all kinds of troubles. Uh, but we learned from that and I'll talk about that here in a moment. But now we've, we've gotten past that, 
backfilled that area and now we're moving back towards the uh, the center itself and that, that's going um, um, really well and I'm, I know the residents who live in that area will be happy when we're out of there. Kimitron Lagoon, I don't think we can call it a lagoon anymore. It's gone, it's backfilled, um, it's done and also being put in a condition to close it for the winter and then come back in the spring to finish the restoration. Private properties, this is a really good story. So prior to um, this year, the most properties we've ever done total combined in all the years we've been doing this was 81 properties. This year alone, we had a target of 78 properties to do in one year. Um, we are at 73 as I speak tonight. So we'll meet that. We also got a head start on next year's properties. And we've uh, scheduled 156 properties for next year. We have two contractors working now and, and uh, really getting into the groove. And so um, we've issued the letters uh, just today to tell uh, homeowners we're coming your way. We promised we would do that last year so that people didn't just wonder if they're gonna knock on the door and say, here we are. So uh, uh, we had some good responses today from homeowners who, are, who will be glad to get this behind them. Uh, the coal gasification site, uh, that's uh, being prepped as we speak. Um, one of the things we we're doing to control the groundwater, because that's right at the surface there. I know if you walk by there, you can see that. Uh, we have what we call a water loo barrier that will contain and, and control the, the groundwater while we do the work. And uh, you can see that restoration is planned for 2025. So we plan to get this all done within, within the next year and then it'll, you know tidy it up at the end. Highland Drive Landfill is... Uh, this is a South Ravine. So this is a, a really nice area. It's, um, if you've ever been down there, it's very tranquil. I like it a lot. We wanna restore it to that. Um, we're also gonna be using permeable reactive barriers to absorb what comes from the landfill. Cause that will continue to happen even after we finish the landfill work because the garbage will still be there. But what, what it will do is it'll keep it from getting into, the, uh, into that area in the future. And uh, this is what it looks like. When we're all done, that's just a representation. And so we think it'll be really nice. Alexander Street Ravine, that's also getting started. Um, we have, uh, thanks to your approval of the special circumstances, we'll only go after the highly, more, more highly contaminated areas. And that way we can save almost, uh, I don't know how much percentage is, sure net, about 75% maybe. But it's a, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of trees that we're not going to, have to remove. So we're, we're pleased with that and that uh, we'll get that done. Our cleanup criteria uh, status, we uh, are still meeting with the federal regulators, uh, Health Canada, MECP and the CNSC. We've had uh, several meetings in the last month. We do expect to get that final draft with, with alignment between us and them uh, to the CNSC commission in January. Um, if, that, if that happens, it's likely we can get a hearing next year. We heard from that, we heard from the CNSC this morning on that. So it's really up to us to get that in there. But the important thing is to get agreement between the agencies and us so that that becomes a more smooth um, hearing when it, when it happens. So that's where we're at, that's where we're at. And it's uh, very close to the end on that one. Just four years in the making. Our, our engagement with, uh, with uh, the communities and indigenous communities has gone really well. Uh, we've involved them, the indigenous communities in, in particular on, especially in our restoration plans uh, with everything we do. And I, I, I recognize that there's um, their involvement in the municipality properties, the ones that you own. And uh, we offer um, to you an opportunity to, to get involved in that more. And I think, I think if we could, uh, we could do that, I think it would go a lot better. But I'll let you think about that and uh, we'll, we'll be back to talk about it. Um, and then um, as far as our neighborhood information sessions, you know, we're still very much involved in the community at the fall fair and, and uh, the salmon event. And we also have these information sessions for, for residents who live around the municipal, municipal properties that we're about to begin doing so that they know what's happening, what the timeline is and what they can expect to see and hear. Um, and so we've had those and, and uh, we've learned not to schedule them at the same time as a council meeting. I don't wanna do that again. Um, as I mentioned early on, uh, this uh, will be closing next week. And uh, you can see the hours up there. We'll be back on the second as well. And uh, before I return the floor to you to, to see if there's any questions or comments, um, you talked about this being the last meeting of the year. This is my last meeting 
I'm stepping down as GM from uh, from uh, the Poor Hope Area Initiative. It's been a pleasure. I, you welcomed me with open arms, uh, mostly, and uh, and I really appreciate that. You gave us a chance to come here and talk to you about what's going on, to get some advice from you and your concurrence on some things. And I appreciate that a lot as well. So um, it's going to continue. It's going to be under good hands. In fact, the guy who's replacing me is here with me today, Scott Cameron. The mayor, council, good to meet you. Look forward to working together. So you'll, you'll, get, you'll see a formal bio come out. We'll also try to get some opportunities with you to, to get to know each other before I leave. And um, Scott uh, is a CNL uh, person, has been for a while. He's that he served and if I get these titles wrong, you, you can you can clean that up later. But he served as a construction director for CNL and also as a deputy general manager at White Shell. Um, Scott is a uh, longtime Port Hope resident. He's lived here over 20 years. So I think you guys are neighbors and that should go well. And with that, um, return it back to you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, for the update, and especially that first visual was was really really uh, good to see. And um, but before I open it up to questions, uh, I want to thank you very much for for your service for overseeing this project so well. We're we're sad to see you go, um, but we also want to wish you all the best in your in your future endeavors and. We, we welcome you, Scott. We look forward to seeing you at the podium and providing us updates in 24 and uh, to keeping your toes to the fire as we continue to move on with, with the initiative. And so, so welcome and, and, and thank you, Mark. But now I'm going to just open it up to uh, questions and comments from, from the floor. Uh, Councillor Adam and then Councillor Claire. Yeah, thank you. Mark, I just want to thank you for all your hard work that you've done. I know that uh, you and I have had a little bit of relationship over the course of the last year, and it's been wonderful. It's been great to work with you. And uh, and I know a lot of this work has maybe something to do with your leadership. So um, I, I do want to thank you for this. I, I wish you were still staying here, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping everything goes well with uh, your next. So thank you. I will, of course, echo everyone's sentiments in thanking you for, for what you've uh, achieved in the last couple of years. I think it's been noticeable, uh, your leadership, and so thank you uh, for that and your contributions. I also have a question. <laughs> I wouldn't let you leave without one more. Um, so I, I have heard from a couple of neighbors, uh, I guess, who I, I understand that they uh, some have been notified, those that are going to be done in 2024 have been notified. So I've heard from some who were hoping to be done in 2024 who have not received that notice, who are looking for some sort of information about when they might be done. I did explain, I've shared what you've shared with us about there are some properties that are sort of on hold until we have a, we know what's going to happen with the criteria change. Um, the question I did say that I would ask is once that is, once we have that information, will it, at that point, will you be able to provide sort of a, a forecast of which areas are going to be pri are being done first, second, third, or, or, or so on after we know what's happening with the criteria change? Um, well, Scott, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Um, so that's one of the things that we really talked about when I first got here was that we really didn't have a good way of scheduling those because it was based on so many factors, the cleanup criteria being one of them. Where are we on the design work? Do we still have some designs to do on certain properties? And and we just have never been good at doing that. So over this last two or three years, uh, we've gotten to a point now where we can at least tell people that we'll be there that year so they don't have to delay a wedding in the backyard or, or something like that. And we told people that if they didn't get a letter from us, that that meant it wouldn't be that year. But we want, we're striving to get to a place where we can actually do that. We're, and we're not there yet, but we're working towards that. You're welcome. Councillor Vicky. Thank you. So I don't have a question, but I just wanted to as well, thank you. I've been on council through your entire duration. And as you were presenting the thoughts through my mind before you announced your departure were how, um, how much movement and momentum as well as um, just 
trust and confidence and calm that you have provided to the, to the community. Um, and I was going to say that before you, <laughs> you announced your departure. So thank you for that. And thank you for everything you've done. And, and I wish you the best. And I welcome Scott. So, no, thank you for that. I do want to say I have a great team. And, uh, you know, I just kind of wind them up and turn them loose. And, uh, um, uh, my, you know, my, my responsibility is to say yes or no. But uh, they're doing a great job. Thank you. And Councillor uh, Todd. Uh, thanks very much. And I actually, I do have a question, but before I do, uh, I would echo the sentiments here and Mark, like things have been going so smoothly. One of the things that uh, is part of my morning routine uh, as I drive down past the pier, like every single morning, I get a coffee, drive down there. And I was reflecting this week. Uh, and again, similar to what uh, Councillor Mink had said, like not knowing that you're departing, I was thinking to myself, wow, like things have really been moving along. It's been smooth. It's been going really well. So congratulations to you, to the team. I, I think the, the presentation is a really nice synopsis of, of the movement that we've seen. I know, you know, in early days, there was a lot more contention, you know, about trying to get stuff going and that's changed. And, and I hope you wear that well, cause you deserve to. Um, I do have a, a question um, around the storage site, um, what is the capacity of that site and what sort of percentage of, uh, of it have we filled up? The capacity is a little over 1.9. It's about 1.92. Um, our estimates are right at capacity right now. So that's that's what we're looking at. The problem we have is every time we, we do an excavation, we find more waste than was anticipated. Um, so, because that was done way back in 2012 for the most part. And so um, we are, uh, we're analyzing that to see what we need to do. Right now, we can still do it if it stays that way. Uh, but if we need to, to build another cell, that, that'll be something we look at. And Councillor Les. Mark, I'm very sorry to see you go. And I wish you, you very much happiness in whatever you uh, embark on next. And Scott, you got big shoes to fill. And thank you. Thank you again, Mark, and uh, all the best for the holidays and all the best in the future endeavors, as I said, and here's to more dashboards in 2024. Right, thank you and happy holidays. So the recommended action identified on the agenda is to receive this presentation for information. Would a member of council like to move to receive this item for information? Moved by Councillor Clare, seconded by Councillor Mink. All in favor? and that motion is passed. Moving on to correspondence, uh, there are three items of correspondence on the agenda tonight, two requested by myself and one from uh, Councillor Clare. 7.1, fair share food bank policy change to transition to, to buy weekly. I believe that you've all received the correspondence um, and the decision of, of the board of, um, of the food bank. But before I actually go into any discussion about this, I, I do believe that um, Councillor Les had a discussion with one of the board members and I would ask him if he wouldn't mind to, to share that with us. Certainly. Um, I spoke on a couple occasions to a couple of different people connected with the food bank over the last week or two. And uh, quite frankly, the reason they are going to this is they are it's not sustainable to continue on the path they were on. Food costs have gone crazy. They're spending upwards of $55,000 a month on topping up uh, the donations that they're receiving. And I said, is it a matter of the volunteers getting burned out? No, it's not that. It's just that they don't see a path forward um, using the current model. Uh, and it, it's sad, but that's the reality. Uh, and just to clarify, Councillor Les, um, so the the model that that you're referring to is moving from being able to access the food bank for once a week to every two weeks. Uh, is it is it the is it the demand, or is there also some issues of food management that um, that they talk to you about? Well, the it depends who you talk to about the food man and management being. Is the food that they're giving out all being utilized in that one week period or not? So there was some some discussion as to whether that was occurring or not. I don't know. I, I don't even want to comment on that. 
um, what they're going to try and do is provide enough food on a shared basis that'll get people through at least four days per week. I think this is the goal they're looking at. And the reason I, I brought this correspondence forward was that I was very, very deeply disturbed at this change in policy of folks only being able to access the food bank once every two weeks instead of once a week. And uh, I could perhaps understand it if we were talking about only um, uh, non-perishable items being accessed every two weeks, but I wonder what that's going to mean to the ability for folks to access perishable items and the things that are so essential to a healthy and well-balanced ba diet. So I really brought this forward to the council table to ask if there is uh, uh, an, uh, an agreement or an appetite to write back to the food bank on this issue and, and raise either questions or, or concerns. And I thought that it would be important to hear from everybody on the council table about this. So, Councillor Clare. Uh, yeah, if I can, I, I might. Uh, I have some information to complement the information shared by Councillor Les. I had a, a really informative conversation with Megan, who's the manager of operations at the food bank, about this, and there were some things there that I found really interesting. So she she did share um, some details that they are about f spending about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars more this year on supplemental food uh, and in addition to what's being donated and that that in combination with the loss of the additional funding they had re received during COVID was was the reason the sort of the as you mentioned the dual pressures um, but that they are reverting back to the levels of service they had pre-COVID. She did point out and I found it a little bit reassuring that um, 66 percent of food banks in Ontario actually ha currently have less than bi-weekly service. And there's currently only 11 percent that are providing weekly service. So we were amongst, uh, you know, the the top tier there in terms of what we were providing, which is excellent. And obviously, I share the concern about losing that. I think we should be striving to maintain that. Um, she did also um, say that most users of our food bank actually don't access it every week even when it's available, um, and that they are aware that the most um, pressing need is amongst our unhoused uh, neighbors who obviously have no very little capacity for food storage, and that they are actively looking at the feasibility of being able to continue weekly service for that particular most vulnerable uh, group. Um, so just to, just to add to, to that some, some additional detail, the other thing she did say is that she is going to try to pull some figures for us in terms of what, what the differential is so that we can understand how much it would take to be able to restore that weekly service. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to get to that to me in advance of today's meeting, but I think that would be helpful for this council, but also for the community to know whether this is a gap that we might find a way to fill together. Anyone else want to add to this? I mean, my when I, when I first saw this, I have to say that my first impetus was to um, write back and say that uh, I'd like to see whether or not there was an ability to make sure that no one is left behind that needs access to the food bank, that it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all kind of policy. I agree that it would be helpful to get some additional metrics, um, but just because, uh, you know, 89% of food banks only offer services every two weeks doesn't mean that we shouldn't still re remain in the top 11%. And is there a way to reach out to the community and ask for additional support uh, to, to help with, with the supply? So uh, I, you know, that's my position is, is to write back and say, you know, we appreciate the, the, uh, the, the stresses on, on the food bank. We appreciate some of the rationale about, how to manage the distribution of food, but we wouldn't want to see anybody turned away from uh, from accessing the food that they need. And also just asking for more questions about metrics and also more questions about what does this mean in terms of people being able to access perishable food, including things like fruit and vegetables and, and other things that don't have a, a two week or longer shelf life. Councillor Les. I'd like to see them um, uh, come to council every uh, month or two 
and just give us an update. This gives them more exposure in the community and keeps us current and uh, we can be reactive uh, if we have to be. I think that's a that's a really terrific idea. Councilor Lewis, Councilor Mink. Thank you, and so I agree with the comments that are, are being made so far. Um, I think that I need more metrics before I make, I can I can say anything. Um, I do know that um, food bank users also have access and do access food banks in other communities locally as well. So that's something I, I really need to know. Um, I, I know uh, many volunteers up in Butley who have people from the urban area of Port Hope. So factoring in the bigger picture, I need that visibility before I can make any assumption of what, what is actually happening operationally. And I, I I think that's a really good point. So how, oh, Councillor, uh, yes, can yeah, I would add to that, um, you know, recognizing that they're the subject matter experts in the situation, you know, uh, allowing them to come forward with a plan and an understanding of what's happening and educate us around, you know, the situation as to what that new model could look like. I would imagine they probably need a little time to build some of that, but I agree. I think once we have that, then that'll give us a, you know, a, a firmer place to stand for. So how would folks feel if we wrote a letter to say that um, we would like to see additional metrics? around this new model that we would like to invite them to to have a delegation in, in front of us to find out more. But in the meantime, uh, to ensure that nobody who needs food is denied food because of, of this policy. Councillor Adam. Uh, thank you. Um, so I've uh, I volunteered at the uh, the food bank a bunch of times and uh, and I know a lot of the people that uh, that do volunteer there. I'm quite confident that uh, they would never turn away somebody that is in need anyways. Um, I also realize that uh, I have never run the food bank, so I don't really want to act like I'm an expert in running a food bank. And um, I, I know that even if they do make this change, that um, if it's not working, they'll make a change again because these are really good people. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I, I don't think anybody around this table... Uh, would question that. So, uh, but I do think that making the making the point that we don't want anybody left behind while you know the metrics are are collected and a new model is sorted out and and definitely I think the invitation to present to council would be a good one. So, rather than just accepting this for information as we normally would, um, are those action items acceptable to everybody and? Uh, Clerk, did you did you want to? <laughs> I know you've been taking notes. <laughs> so um, there were a few things that were shared there. So I will just um, read out uh, some of the um, some of the last items that I think wanted to be part of the letter. So um, I noted here that a resolution be presented at the next council. Uh, at the next council meeting to direct staff to prepare a letter on behalf of council to the fair share food bank expressing support for the organization and requesting further information regarding educating council on what the new model looks like including additional metrics inviting them to make a presentation to council in 2024 and ensuring that in the meantime no one is left behind based on the policy as shared by the fair share food bank Okay, so I'll I'll uh, I'll move that, uh, Ma Madam Mayor. Oh no, I can't move that. I I'd, I'd love to move it, but I have to give over <laughs> the chair. So I'm going to have to ask for a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Claire, seconded by Councillor Adam. All in favor? And that motion is uh, carried. Thank you for that. Moving on to item 7.2, uh, Town of Bracebridge regarding changes to the Legislation Act 20, uh, 2006, and Councillor Claire will speak to the matter. Uh, thank you, Mayor um, uh, For those of you who don't have the attachments, this was a letter about a resolution passed by the uh, Municipality of Bracebridge uh, regarding their inability to be compliant with the Legislation Act of 2006, specifically to providing 
public notice for certain municipal business in printed publications. Um, and I raised it to our agenda after speaking with the manager of communications, uh, because obviously here in Port Hope, like so many other municipalities in Ontario, we are now in that same boat with the loss of our print newspaper. Um, and uh, I know that our, our communications team are really working hard on other ways to provide that public notice and are keenly aware of the challenge of reaching uh, folks in offline. Um, I'd be happy to have us endorse the resolution uh, from Bracebridge, but I recognize that this is, I think, not the first piece of correspondence we've received. So I believe the Ontario government has been receiving correspondence from other municipalities on this. Um, I, I wanted to, I know uh, Kate Ingram's not here this evening, I didn't know if uh, the Director of Corporate Services wanted to comment at all on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have been looking at options and we'll continue to look at options through 2023 with respect to how to fill the gap created by the lack of local newspaper. Um, we anticipate the province will be adjusting legislation to address this gap sort of understanding the impact across the province. It's completely at uh, council's discretion as to whether or not uh, support for the resolution is provided formally. Um, uh, the provincial government ha has made clear that their, their sort of direct avenue to municipalities will be through its uh, memorandum of understanding with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Uh, and we know that the AMO is uh, advocating the same. Any other questions or, or comments? I think this is early days in, in terms of sorting out uh, new modes of communication. And, and certainly I think we're all feeling this seismic shift in losing our print media and sorting out what what is gonna fill those gaps um, effectively. So thank you for bringing this forward. Are you, are you comfortable to receive this correspondence for information? Okay, so that is the uh, that is the um, that is the motion. Can I get a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Clare, seconded by Councillor Less. All in favor? And that motion is carried. And the last correspondence, uh, seven point three, Philip Lawrence, MP, Northumberland, Peterborough South, regarding initiative to find sister cities in Ukraine for municipalities in Canada. I believe you've all seen this uh, correspondence. So I'm going to just open it up for any questions or or comments. Okay. Uh, okay. So the so there's a there's a couple of things we can do here is to receive the correspondence for information or to take it a step further to ask staff to look at this request and bring back a report regarding the, the participation and what the benefits of such participation might be for the municipality of Port Hope. Councillor Less. <clears throat> the councillor and I, uh, Councillor Adam and I had a bit, brief conversation on this and um, uh, you know, I. Like if it's just a, a general handshake between two um, uh, towns, then, you know, that has a limited appeal. And if it has more substance, um, that according to, and I won't speak for you, Councillor Adam, but you had a, con a, a conversation with uh, Philip Lawrence. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I've uh, I've spoke to uh, to um, uh, MP Lawrence uh, about this. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing what the benefits actually are. Um, you know, it's one thing just saying that you're going to do something, but what does it do for us? What does it do for them? Where where does that go? Um, and uh, and currently, I don't have that information. <laughs> so. And I think that's a that's a really good point. I I did ha also have a, a further conversation about this, and I was very clear that um, that this had to be more than just a handshake or a letter of memorandum to to make sense for the municipality from my perspective, and that some of the things that might be of interest are actually seem some economic development uh, ties and opportunities as well as other things that uh, might be uh, on the table. But again, that can't be decided ahead of time. That has to be sort of decided by speaking to in more detail with 
uh, whatever town they would be recommending for this kind of twinning. And I do think that they have a short list for that in listening to what some of the needs might be. But I made it very clear that it would have to be a reciprocal relationship, not a one-way relationship. And I also made it very clear, as we all know, coming out of budget, that we don't have any financial resources for for any kinds of one-way projects. Um, so I made that uh, I made that very very clear. Uh, Councillor Mink. Thank you. So through the chair, my comment was going to be what you had just said is that um, not only um, would I like to see the benefit, but what is the cost associated? If there's a financial benefit to Port Hope, great. But um, we just went through the budget and there is really limited resources for spending. And if there isn't a gain, then it's something that, that we need to know up front before going any further. Councillor Lass. <clears throat> Based on what we, we find out, I think we should take a leadership position if it, it's to our liking to do this, to maybe create a model that other, uh, that the feds can look at and say, hey, you know, Port Hope is doing this with this uh, community, and it could be an exchange student type thing, or, or some sort of economic development. But I think we we should put our our heads down and say, okay, if we want to do it, let's do it right. Let's put up what we think is the right thing to do, put a cost to it, and see if we can get some grant funding. No, I I appreciate that, and and certainly, you know, the idea of Twin Cities is not new. It's it's something that um, is done done very frequently. I, I like the idea of bringing this back to staff to do a, a, a quick report for us to to consider and to delve in a little bit more into the uh, details of what this might be. Councillor Clare? Yeah, I, I did want to say I did appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness in terms of the, the community that they're proposing that we be twinned with. There's a lot of um, commonalities just in terms of size are the sort of the rural nature of the community the industry and agriculture and tourism base and things like that so I think that's really promising um, if we're going to move forward and and sort of uh, ask staff they like to see us think a little bit outside just the coffers of the municipality but look at would there be an interest by the Chamber of Commerce might there be some interest from other community groups um, I know the like the 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 cadet uh, group. They had uh, an experience going overseas, uh, going to Europe as well. Um, it would be neat to see how this could be sort of uh, integrated through other community connections as well. Um, but I suspect there will be some interest in the community, given our relationship with the Ukrainian, so that we have welcomed into our community thanks to uh, to, to your leadership, Mayor. So I, I, I'd be interested to see how this could be sort of a broader community uh, experience. Yeah, and I and I do think there there is um, uh, a segment now in Port Hope, which is which is uh, the Ukrainian families that that came after the war that uh, could also be consulted on on this kind of initiative to gauge the sort of the community interest in in moving forward with uh, this kind of project. and And the pronunciation of the town is Nadvirna, so we can. We like to to put a motion forward uh, yes um, that's correct mayor so we have some wording prepared um i'll just read it under that a resolution be presented at the next council meeting of the correspondence from philip lawrence mp northumberland peterborough south regarding the initiative to find sister cities in ukraine for municipalities in canada and refer it to staff and that staff be directed to bring back a report on next steps regarding participating in the initiative to find sister cities in Ukraine, including resource implications. So can I get a, a mover and seconder moved by Councillor Less, seconded by uh, Councillor May. Uh, all in favor? Oh, yeah, we can, yeah, absolutely, discussion. I'm just trying to remember exactly what you said. Did the benefits of doing this? Was that was that in there? I, sorry, I'm just trying to remember what I. So the way that I I heard it, it was um, that staff be directed a report on next steps regarding participating in this initiative to find sister cities in the Ukraine, including resource implications. And, and so, should we can add benefits in there as well, or be, if okay, so so including costs, resource implications, and benefits. Okay. 
Okay, any other any other discussion? Okay, uh, we'll take a vote, all in favor. And that resolution is passed. Moving on to staff and committee reports. 8.1, staff report CS 1823, re-archival services for the municipality of Port Hope. Uh, is there anything further staff want to add to this report? And I'm looking at our director. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hankiski. Yes, I mean, it's a long report, so I can't, uh, I'm not going to try to summarize it here tonight for you. But uh, ultimately, you've seen the report, and we've had a request uh, to re resume the Port Hope Archives collection that has come from the Port Hope Archives board. This is following years of them uh, looking and having discussions about the future of that organization, uh, discussions regarding the Port Hope Archives potentially uh, joining Northumberland County Archives and Museum. I think initiated around 2019. Um, those discussions have developed into a request for the municipality of Port Hope to directly assume the collection uh, and continue negotiations with the North Northumberland County Archives and Museum as to the future considerations. Uh, the Port Hope Archives is run by a dedicated board of volunteers, uh, but maintaining funding for a full-time archivist consistently has been a, a primary challenge associated with their organization. And as such, the archives closed their doors in April 2023 with limited access to the public. Tonight's request, uh, again, is for the municipality to assume the collection, appoint the county and the archives museum as the official archivist and the archival repository. Uh, and further direct staff to engage with the Northumberland County Archives and Museum on those further discussions. Uh, I think it's important to recognize, and we do recognize the sensitivity uh, of ensuring access to the collection uh, and the maintain maintenance of the collection is a top priority through this transition or the proposed transition. Uh, we would be working with county archives um, and with an intention to explore options and report back to council. Um, some of those options might look at, uh, you know, the future use of 17 Mill Street uh, as an archives uh, satellite location. May look at options related to ensuring displays are regularly or even more regularly displayed at the Port Hope Library. And we'll certainly make recommendations and provide options related to service levels. Um, while assigning the county archives as the archivist, um, the, or this is required as the municipality simply doesn't have staff on hand with the, re, or, uh, with the archival expertise that the county does. We anticipate that the county archive staff will be able to, through the transition and through the assessment period, assuming the county is supportive, uh, manage requests related to access to the collection. Uh, if the resolution's passed tonight, I assure you this won't be the last report council considers relating to the topic. We anticipate to report back uh, in the first quarter of 2024 with respect to those next steps. And I am very happy to answer as many questions as I can try to answer. Uh, thank you very much for that um, broad overview. And I'm sure there's going to be questions from around the table, starting with Councillor Adam. Uh, thank you. Um, Brian, do you know, I, I know that you talked about the uh, the library there. Um, have you had any contact with them to know if that is a possibility of moving some of the things over there as kind of like a satellite type de deal? Um, I realize that a lot of the, uh, the materials are very sensitive, so they wouldn't be able to be moved very often, but maybe things that could stay there for a longer period of time. Uh, thank you. We obviously have a, a strong supportive uh, relationship with our library. I don't anticipate any challenge with respect to um, their abilities to display material here and there. I believe they already do. We'd look at enhancing that uh, and, and potentially look at options uh, that were more permanent. But I, we have not engaged in those discussions directly. What's required first is direction from council with respect to assuming the collection. Councillor Mink. Thank you. Um, so through the chair, I have a couple of comments and then a question. I think that um, this is a good move for several reasons. Um, first, the building is not accessible. And um, that's one question that I think we all have to think about in the years coming is 
what are we doing with that building? Um, do we have the resources financially to make it accessible for whatever it's going to be? Um, the other thing is that it is in a floodplain and having archives in a floodplain is probably the least ideal location for, for that type of record. Um, and the county archives are, I, to my understanding, state-of-the-art, climate-controlled, ideal situation. Um, the question I have, though, is I have heard this is coming from the archive group closing their doors, and I've heard nothing from that group. So it's as far as communicating to the public that this isn't a council's decision to take the archives and send them away. This is, we are responding to the request that's coming to us. So my question is, how will we be communicating that clear to the public so it isn't misunderstood? Uh, thank you. That's a good question. I, I don't want to speak to sort of past efforts related to communications, but going forward, uh, if directions received tonight, we'll work directly with the, the Port Hope archives to issue joint statements, issue joint releases, whatever's required to communicate the message as, as clearly and transparently as we can. Councilor Clare. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I, I, I particularly appreciate the consideration for uh, looking for opportunities to have some of the collection on display here in our community. That seems to be a pretty big concern uh, in the public about this, uh, the closure of the archives and the potential move. I did have a question that I'd said that I would ask uh, tonight. And I know in the in the draft resolution, there is a reference to the Haskell collection that has some limitation on movement, and there may be some others. I have had a question uh, about whether other families who may have donated um, materials in the past without such a condition will have the opportunity to consider that. Um, at this point, uh, before before the collection is moved uh, out of Port Hope. Well, I, I just want to comment on that last part. This report identifies uh, that the collection may stay. We're going to look at continued storage potentially at 17 Mill Street, uh, or with the, the county archives, or a combination of both. So. Uh, I think in in sort of a release going forward and further communications and and most importantly that report back to council in the first quarter, there will be an opportunity to uh, further identify and further sort of promote an opportunity from those who may have an interest in materials previously donated um, to to be involved in decisions going forward. I, I think it's safe to say if there's not a specific donor agreement in place sort of at the time, um, a lot of that decision making is going to be subject to the Northumberland County and the municipality. And of course, we'll work with uh, the archives uh, through that assessment period to make sure uh, we're providing the best recommendations possible. Any other comments or point for discussion? Oh, I think I think the first three comments really did cover m much of the territory. So thank you for the report. Thank you for the comments. Uh, can I ask for a mover and seconder to refer to resolutions? Uh, moved by Councillor Todd, seconded by Councillor Less. All in favor? And the resolution is passed. So moving on to the consent agenda resolutions. Items under this section are generally considered collectively as one motion. Council members may request that specific items be removed for separate discussion, deliberation, and action. Would any council member like to remove items for uh, discussion? Seeing none, can I get a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Mink. All in favor? And that is passed. Moving on to item 10 bylaws, we will uh, now move on to 10.179, 2023 open air burning bylaw. Is there anything further that anyone would like to add before we vote on the matter? Question period will come at the very end. Uh, Going back to 10.1, 79, 2023, open air burning bylaw. Is there anything further that anybody? Okay, so can I ask for a mover and seconder for the reading of bylaw 79, 2023? Moved by Councillor Less, seconded by Councillor Clare. All in favor? And that resolution is passed. 
So now thereof be it resolved that bylaw 79 2023 be read a third time passed and that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk, sealed with the seal of the corporation, engrossed in the bylaw book. Can I get a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Todd, seconded by Councillor Less. All in favor? And that bylaw resolution is passed. We don't have any new or other business currently listed on tonight's agenda move on to county update and i do have a number of updates if my glasses don't completely fog up by the end of them i forgot what it's like to be wearing a mask and glasses at the same time so the one thing i'm just going to briefly touch upon and we'll we'll be getting more information i think as we move forward is that the county also now has passed its budget so we know what what that percentage is for. It's a multi-year budget. It's a three-year budget. It's the first time that the county has done that. We anticipate that as we go, there'll be adjustments for um, the next uh, two years. But I think it's a, an exercise to both see some of the, the short-term needs as well as to have some perspective on long-term planning. So that that is a first for the county. But the increase at the county level is um, just like we did the the median here in Port Hope is being an additional cost of $305 a year. From the county perspective, using that same metric, it is $95 a year of an increase in, in taxes. So we're looking at approximately a 9% increase between the municipality and the county in terms of an increase in taxes. So. Um, one thing that I just do want to know is that it's not taking the percentage increase here plus adding the, the county number. It's a different calculation based on that pie chart that we have been communicating and will continue to communicate that a certain portion of the tax increase comes from the municipality, another part comes from the county, and a third part comes from educational taxes as well. Uh, in terms of just some highlights from uh, the county budget, something that I wanted to, to note for Ward 2 in particular is that there is $3.25 million set aside from 2024 to 2025 in the county budget to improve the intersection of welcome. This is, a, a, I would say, a finally kind of moment because the work on uh, looking at improving the safety started back in 2019. And so now we finally have uh, money set aside, a robust amount of, amount of money aside to improve uh, those operational and safety considerations at the, at the intersection of County Road number two, County Road number 10, and County Road number 74, Dale Road, in the hamlet of welcome. So no pun intended, but this is very welcome news and it is going to be transformative for the hamlet and for the safety of, of the community. So I'm very happy to bring that forward. Uh, another important um, highlight that I'd like to share is that um, I did put forward a motion to the county's 2024 budget for a six month pilot treatment program for specialized residential treatment for addictions and mental health in our community. A motion was put forward to set aside $241,000 to ensure that six to 12 persons in our community that will be identified by county staff will have access to such treatment in the first ever public private partnership. We also have a strong indication at this point that the province is going to match that, that amount so that we'll be able to reach between uh, 12 and 24 people in the six month period of time. It is significant because we do not have specialized inpatient treatment for addictions and mental health for adults in our community that is accessible with the exception of one community bed. Typically this kind of residential care for those of you who may not be familiar costs in the neighborhood of $22,000 a month. So this is a very important, it's going to provide structure. It provides intense 24 seven around the clock care. And it's going to be an important addition and complement to 
310 Division Street, which have which as I have noted at this at this council table, is the property that the county recently purchased to modernize sheltering and transition and supports for um, those needing access to shelter and who are experiencing homelessness in our community. So we're starting to see the development of a more holistic coordinated uh, care model. The pilot is going to be uh, fully evaluated and reported on after six months. And if it's shown to be successful, we hope that we'll be able to advocate for ongoing supports of uh, such nature. Uh, that is it for uh, county updates. It's now time for question period. And remember, question period is for questions only and is an opportunity for members of the public to ask questions of council. Please note that this is not meant to be an avenue to ask questions to staff. If you have uh, questions specifically for your council members, you can ask them now. And we're going to just start around the council table. Any questions here? Okay, uh, there I don't see any media with us today. So questions from the public? Oh, Councillor Claire does have a question. Apologies, <laughs> I missed that part. I, I did have a question um, and it's for the clerk, uh, I believe about the, um, uh, count, uh, the advisory committees. I understand that the uh, applications for the advisory committees closed on the 15th. And I've had a few people ask for updates about what the timeline will be on hearing about interviews and the likely striking of those committees in the new year. So uh, thank you, um, Councillor Holloway Wadwani, for that question. So as you're aware, the, the recruitment did close on December 15th, which was a few days ago. So we received 51 applications through the recruitment, and we developed a streamlined process for recruitment, leveraging the existing HR technology that we have. The process was led by our acting deputy clerk, Amanda Miller. Um, we're currently in the process of compiling the applications and have started circulating them to the staff liaisons in the specific departments. Um, in terms of next steps, the staff liaisons will be working with the uh, designates, the council designates on each of the committees to uh, set up interviews of selected candidates in accordance with our appointment policy. Once they have determined the um, selected candidates in accordance with that policy, uh, we will be bringing forward a resolution to for council consideration of the selected candidates. So, um, you know, it really is dependent in terms of timelines with when the interviews are, be, are able to be set up by the staff liaisons as well as the availability of the candidates, but we are hoping for most committees to start uh, their new term in February. Um, I do also want to note that uh, Legislative Services is going to be doing a review of the committee bylaw in Q1, and we're going to be bringing forward some housekeeping amendments as well as any necessary updates at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so now I'm going to uh, turn it over to the public. So if anybody has a question, please make your way to the podium. And I would ask you to press the famous button there and uh, just please uh, introduce yourself with your name and your street address. Hello again, <clears throat> Dan Jaynes of uh, the Hamlet of Welcome. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first in regards uh, to 50 Cabot Street has, uh, has council come up with a resolve or is there any update at the 50 Cabin Street that was brought to you guys, the problems there? Uh, uh, our director Williams is, is not here today. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if there's uh, any updates that they, the CAO can, can share at this point. Thank you for the question. Um, Director Williams is unable to attend tonight's um, meeting, and as of right now, staff does not have any updates on 50 Cabin Street. Thank you. So not so much a question as I wanted to let council know. Um, I know there's a meeting uh, January 16th in regards to a zoning bylaw for um, a property on Dale Road. Um, and that's not so much my question, but um, my sister sitting beside me 
um, hosted a bit of a community awareness thing and a little bit of a Christmas get together on December 16th. And as of December 16th, I probably the furthest point from that zoning bylaw change property was the only one in our hamlet that received a letter of public of notice. So I just wanted to let the council know that we spoke directly to four properties touching it or directly across the road from it that I was the first one that gave them the information, the document that I received in the mail. So letters are not receiving those people as of December 16th. Uh, thank you for that information and we'll, we'll note it and pass it on to, to staff. Um, I do have... Uh, one question in regards to the archives, um, not that the sensitivity and the items and everything that would be going to the county level, um, would council put some kind of bylaw or amendment in the proposal or when it goes there or if it goes there or if it's joint, would there be bylaws uh, put in place that the items um, I don't want to use the word ownership because the archives isn't an ownership. It's a collective of, of different things, but we don't want to lose our power as a municipality or citizens to that information or the availability of getting it back if it's subsequently changed in that manner. Am I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but I just want those items protected that the municipality isn't giving them away, but they're going to be cared for and there's bylaws in place that protect our community and those items. Uh, thank you for that question about the bylaws and uh, uh, director, would you like to respond? I'm, I'm sure that all of those considerations will be taken into account in the subsequent um, report, but I'll, I'll let the director speak to that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you're correct. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll address our agreement with Northumberland County. Uh, just keep in mind, we are a member municipality of uh, Northumberland County, uh, and our mayor sits as a county councillor and now deputy warden. Um, so any any agreement with the county will be identified in sort of future considerations to count to council. But we don't anticipate uh, we don't anticipate sort of longer term decisions to or to be a to be a challenge with uh, our partners at the county. Uh, thank you, Director, and actually thank you for noting, I forgot to mention during my county update that I, I was nominated and I'm now the Deputy Warden of Northumberland County. Uh, Councillor Claire would like to um, yeah, answer. Yeah, just to add to your first question about 50 Cavan Street, sorry, I was just checking the correspondence to see if there was any indication it wasn't, it was confidential in any way and it's not, so I did want to reassure you and I know others in the community that have been following that story that um, that uh, according to Director Williams, who unfortunately is not here to speak to it, um, he did uh, send an update to council on the issue and they are on it. They are working with the property owner actively as bylaw on the, the number of issues that are ongoing there. So it, we don't, we can't speak to the details, but just to assure you that he is on that and, and bylaw is, is working with the property owner. So that basically the, the commitment that was made is being followed through, but there isn't any co concrete resolution as of yet. Uh, any other questions from, from the audience this evening? Sorry, can you just press the button and speak clearly into, into the microphone? Thanks very much. Uh, Cameron Green, 23 Trafalgar Street. And I just want to say first, uh, Mr. Huey, thanks for your service the last couple of years. We appreciate it. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration on my part to say, it seems like the project just started two years ago when you got here. I'm in area five, there, which they're working on currently, and I've seen properties being dug 10 feet down, finished in 10 weeks perfectly, so very impressive. I'd say I'm concerned that you're leaving, except Mr. Cameron's here tonight, so I won't say that out loud. <laughs> uh, I've recently interacted with Phi with a simple request to provide me with an update as to when I can expect our property to be remediated. <clears throat> I found the lack of information and the lack of transparency to be very concerning, and 
trust me, I'm not a, a hammer in look of a nail, so. And I also don't like public speaking, as you see, so. After 10 weeks consisting of an in-person meeting, several phone calls and emails, and persistent questioning on my part, I did receive information specific to my property, but I do not think other residents of Port Hope should have to go through the same experience in order to get information that they, in my opinion, are entitled to. I'll not bore you with the details specific to my inquiry, but I'm certainly willing to meet with a representative Phi <clears throat> or town council or both together to recap my experience. Uh, for context, I'd put a phone call into Phi annually since 2018 to get an update on progress on our property and receive very little information, but did get the sense that things were under control. I don't normally get involved to the extent that I am now, as I usually rely on people to do what they say they'll do or to engage with me if there are challenges. In my discussions with Phi, I've had to rely on what sparse and vague information they would provide me. I note that as recently as the fall of 2018 newsletter, we were being told that 2023 was the expected completion date for the project. I find it hard to believe that at that late date, Phi did not have a pretty good sense that the timeline would not be met. It's this lack of straightforward and transparent information and discussion that concerns me. From what I gather, and admittedly I may be wrong on some facts as I've had to piece this together through online research and information, information I picked up through discussions, the project to remediate homes is now expected to go until 2030. I must admit that I've lost trust and faith in FI and feel that we need a mechanism to ensure they are held accountable, that timelines are being met, and that information is forthcoming. At this point in time, I feel that we, the affected property owners, and in fact, all residents of Port Hope are due straightforward factual information as to where the project stands and what the future of the project holds. There was a community liaison group that I believe was disbanded in 2018, and I could not find anyone outside of FI themselves to mediate the problems I was having getting information from FI. And I, I just want to add quickly that as I was escalating this, I asked for your email, Mr. Huey, and they said I couldn't have your email. Even though mark.huey at CNL is not too difficult, I did honor that, but it's just another point of, of the lack of transparency. I can email the mayor, I believe, so. I was glad to see these quarterly updates to town council from FI as I was not aware of them and reviewed some past quarterly presentations from FI to town council. Forgive me, council. <laughs> I was once again concerned by the lack of specific information provided to council from FI as to the status of the project. And I must say, I was surprised at the one or two questions directed by FI to FI by the town council and the lack of illumination, illuminating information that this exercise uncovers. Similar to tonight, you know, I had learned through, not through the newsletter or any widely disseminated information, but through going to a meeting and discussions that 75 properties are being done this year and 150 next year. It hasn't been widely disseminated. So, you know, the information that we got specific to small sites tonight, that was it. But given the project did not meet expectations and is now in the second 10 year contract, I believe the time's come for a more fulsome, straightforward conversation. How are we gonna know if we're gonna be able to meet the timeline of 2030 if all we know is what's happening in the next year and a half? I'm not a lawyer, and again, I may be mistaken, but there appears to be language in the legal agreement that was established at the outset of this project that appears to have the Township of Port Hope establish a community advisory committee, which will be responsible to the respectable, respective council with a mandate to liaison with Canada regarding all aspects of the work being undertaken for the project, shall provide public input on the project planning and implementation and assist them in communicating with the public. My question is this, <clears throat> does council have a mandate or responsibility to ensure citizens are provided straightforward, timely and accurate information on the progress of the project if not a mandate or legal agreement, does council believe the public is entitled to straightforward, timely and accurate information on the progress of the project? And lastly, does council believe the residents of Port Hope, especially those affected directly, have received straightforward, timely and accurate information on the progress of the project? 
If not, are there steps that can be taken to ensure communication improves going forward? Thanks. Thank you for those um, for those questions. And I, I actually heard a, a few other questions other than the last ones, which were also around timeline adherence and questions around um, the community advisory in addition to the to the communication questions. So uh, I'm going to start by saying that I do believe that everybody in Port Hope has a right for for straightforward and clear and transparent communications around all the cleanup initiatives that are happening in our community, including those that are happening on residential properties. Um, absolutely, I don't think there is anybody around this table that would disagree with, with that sentiment. In terms of doing things differently, doing things better, I, I, I do believe that we have asked that. Um, uh, from this council table, I believe that that's why we've been receiving information package in a in a different way than we have in in the past. But in terms of your own particular um, property, uh, I can't answer that from from where I'm sitting now. I don't have enough background and context on that. Uh, I would I would welcome uh, any of my council members to weigh in on this, and I would also welcome our representatives if if you uh, would like to to address some of these concerns, as there some of them are directly towards you as well. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, can you turn on that? Yeah. I don't want to rehash the past, although it would be interesting to know what what you've learned in the past that helps you going forward. But I'm just looking for, so not rehash the past, I'm looking for citizens like myself. I don't want them to go through what I went through to try and get what I feel is simple information. So I'm just wondering, is there a third party? And can council be that party? Is council mandated or will they take on to be the third party to be the communicator between Phi and ourselves? Well, the council is not mandated for that. Um, we, we do have um, st staff that, um, oversee the project and would communicate through staff reports and other ways to the council that we can then report to directly um, to the public. Thank you. Hi, Cameron. Nice to see you in person. Um, I, I, I did want to pick up, you, you mentioned a couple of, I quoted a couple of pieces from section 5.2.3 of the original agreement. Um, and I, I think we, we've had a conversation already, but I did have some long conversations with our previous CAO about that, given that at the bottom, the last part of that clause, section G, does specify that in the absence of that community commi liaison committee, um, sorry, community advisory committee, that the municipality itself shall fulfill all of the functions outlined for that committee. And I had raised concerns about whether we were in fact fulfilling that um, from a perspective of communication um, and uh, ensuring public engagement around uh, the PHAI. Uh, I just, just want to point out that we have now a new CAO and a new general manager, uh, both sort of new to the roles. So I think your question is probably quite timely about whether it is time to have a conversation about renewing that community advisory committee. And if not, I certainly will continue to want to have discussion about what that means in terms of the municipality fulfilling those functions as outlined in the contract. Uh, thank you. And. Uh... Mark, would you like to just for the final comment before we close? It was already on. Um, so clearly, um, is, we strive for transparency. It's my expectation that we tell residents and council and anybody who inquires the truth about what we know. And sometimes the, the transparency is we don't know, and that's okay too. I just want I want that to be out. So uh, I'm concerned by what I heard tonight. Um, certainly we'll have records that I can go back and, uh, and I will take a look at uh, what's been going on. I'm uh, surprised by the email uh, situation. It's, uh, it's on the website. I'm happy if anybody has my email, my phone number, um, and uh, several residents, uh, both happy and unhappy, have uh, contacted me personally. I believe they've even contacted me through some council members, and that's okay too, and, and, and I've responded to those. And so we'll take a look at that particular situation and, and also learn from it. Uh, one of the things that we 
are also as a learning organization. We don't want to just plod forward and not see what we can do better. And I think you've seen that over the last two or three years. And uh, you'll continue to see that under Scott's leadership. But um, I, I will certainly get back with, uh, with this gentleman personally. And uh, if there's any questions that linger after this and you, and you think about it, um, I know you know how to get a hold of me and I'm happy to talk about it. Thank you. And I, I do have one further uh, follow-up question. What is your policy in terms of turnaround time for emails and inquiries from the public on any individual project, especially residential projects? We want to turn it around as, as soon as we possibly can. Sometimes the information takes a lot longer to dig for some residents than others. Um, there's also been situations where there's been a lot of back and forth between my staff and a resident, and that can sometimes um, provide a great deal of documentation that we have to go through so I can get to the bottom of what's going on. I'm, I'm talking about first point of contact. Are, are you prepared oh. to, to make a commitment that within you know, X days or X day that a resident that reaches out to you directly, not to you directly, but uh, around a project that they can expect to get an acknowledgement of their request with some kind of indication of when they'll find out more information? Yeah, in terms of that, yeah, but the first contact, you should be told right away, thank you for the email, thank you for the question, we'll get right back to you as soon as we can. And we also offer a, a point of contact, my name. Um, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, they have someone they can talk to. And every, every uh, resident property we're working on, the, uh, the, there is a communication liaison that works with that person to provide that back and forth information. Thank we you. also have a very robust uh, public programs office now. Uh, uh, prior to 21, um, the communications team was just taking those kinds of questions and concerns as part of that communication liaison, and there really wasn't any structure to that. We now have a very uh, uh, resourced and a robust uh, pro public programs where we handle communications and complaints uh, that, that rise to that level. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to just ask for, uh, perhaps you can continue on unless this is directly to, to us. Okay, th thank you for that uh, communication. Uh, any final questions or from the audience? Yes. Hi, Sarah Turk, uh, Hamlet of Welcome. So yesterday being Monday, I had a gentleman, he was on County Road 10 doing surveys. Um, as a resident, I went out and talked to him mainly because I got a big scary German Shepherd who was barking at him, but he wasn't sure what he was surveying for. He thought it was to bring water past the four corners and welcome. Um, later found out that he actually came right up to my house, tagged in my well, tagged in my front. I mean, as a dog owner, I didn't even know he was going to be coming that far up on the property. He couldn't tell me what he was surveying from what responsibilities and what kind of notifications should I have received that that was going to be surveyed and looked at? Or is this some kind of stranger that's just checking things out in the community? Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I'll, I'll bring that concern and question to, to staff and we'll, we'll get a response to that. Okay. I believe uh, that that is all for the questions from the floor. So I'm moving on to, oh, Councillor Lutz. I, I want somebody to check Gad's heartbeat because I can't believe he's being silent. No questions, Ed? I can't understand a lot of the stuff that's been going on tonight. So I'm just okay, um, moving on to... I. <laughs> Okay. Uh, moving on to item 14, confirmatory bylaw. It is now time for the confirmatory bylaw. This bylaw confirms the proceedings that took place this evening and provides a formal adoption through a bylaw. Can I get a mover and seconder? Moved by Councillor Todd, seconded by Councillor Less. 14.1, 80, 2023, confirm the proceedings of the council members of December 19th, 2023. I'm going to call a vote. And that motion is passed. This concludes our business to be covered on today's agenda and indeed for 2023. We have reached the end and I'm in a position to adjourn the meeting. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, thank you. And it's 7.58 p.m. <laughs>